battle against revilers. Second, we must not be deterred or coerced into silence by the kinds of intimidation I've described. We must insist on our constitutional right and duty to exercise our religion, to vote our conscience, consciences on public issues, and to participate in elections and debates in the public square and in the halls of justice. These are the rights of all citizens, and they are also the rights of religious leaders. While our Church rarely speaks on public issues, it does so by exception on what the First Presidency defines as significant moral issues, which could surely include laws affecting the fundamental legal, cultural, moral environment of our communities and nations. We must also insist on this companion condition of democratic government. When churches and their members or any other group speak out on public issues, win or lose, they have a right to expect freedom from retaliation. Along with many others, we were disappointed with what we experienced in the aftermath of California's adoption of Proposition 8 including vandalism of Church facilities and harassment of Church members by firings and boycotts of member businesses and by retaliation against donors. Mormons were the targets of most of this, but it also hit other Churches in the Pro-8 coalition and other persons who could be identified as supporters. Fortunately, some recognized such retaliation for what it was. A full-page ad in the New York Times branded this, quote, violence and intimidation, unquote, against religious organizations and individual believers, quote, simply because they supported Proposition 8 as an outrage that must stop, end of quote. The fact that this ad was signed by some leaders who had no history of friendship for our faith only added to its force. It is important to note that while this aggressive intimidation in connection with the Proposition 8 election was primarily directed at religious persons and symbols, it was not anti-religious as such. These incidents were expressions of outrage against those who disagreed with the gay rights position and had prevailed in a public contest. As such, these incidents of violence and intimidation are not so much anti-religious as anti-democratic. In their effect, they are like the well-known and widely condemned voter intimidation of blacks in the South that produced corrective federal civil rights legislation. Third, we must insist on our freedom to preach the doctrines of our faith. Why do I make this obvious point? Religious people who share our moral convictions feel some intimidation. Fortunately, our leaders do not refrain from stating and explaining our position that homosexual behavior is sinful. Last summer, Elder M. Russell Ballard spoke these words to a BYU audience, quote, We follow Jesus Christ by living the law of chastity. God gave this commandment, and he has never revoked or changed it. This law is clear and simple. No one is to engage in sexual relationships outside the bounds the Lord has set. This applies to homosexual behavior of any kind and to heterosexual relationships outside marriage. It is a sin to violate the law of chastity. We follow Jesus Christ by adhering to God's law of marriage, which is marriage between one man and one woman. This commandment has been in place from the very beginning. That's the end of the quote from Elder Ballard. We will continue to teach what our Heavenly Father has commanded us to teach and to trust that the precious free exercise of religion remains strong enough to guarantee our right to exercise this most basic freedom. Fourth, as advocates of the obvious truth that persons with religious positions or motivations have the right to express their religious views in public, we must nevertheless be wise in our political 
participation. Preachers have been prime movers in the civil rights movement from the earliest advocates of abolition. But even the civil rights of religionists must be exercised legally and wisely. As Latter-day Saints, we should never be reticent to declare and act upon the sure foundations of our faith. The call of conscience, whether religious or otherwise, requires no secular justification. At the same time, religious persons will often be most persuasive in political discourse by framing arguments and positions in ways that are respectful of those who do not share their religious beliefs and that contribute to the reasoned discussion and compromise that is essential in a pluralistic society. Fifth and finally, Latter-day Saints must be careful never to support or act upon the idea that a person must subscribe to some particular set of religious beliefs in order to qualify for a public office. The framers of our Constitution included a provision that no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States, end of quote. That constitutional principle forbids a religious test as a legal requirement, but it, of course, leaves citizens free to cast their votes on the basis of any preference they choose. But wise religious leaders and members will never advocate religious tests for public office. Fragile freedoms are best preserved when not employed beyond their intended purpose. If a candidate is seen to be rejected at the ballot box primarily because of religious belief or affiliation, the precious free exercise of religion is weakened at its foundation, especially when this reason for rejection has been advocated by other religionists. Such advocacy suggests that if religionists prevail in electing their preferred candidate, This will lead to the use of government power in support of their religious beliefs and practices. The religion of a candidate should not be an issue in a political campaign. And now in conclusion, it was the Christian principles of human worth and dignity that made possible the formation of the United States Constitution over 200 years ago. And only those principles in the hearts of a majority of our diverse population can sustain that Constitution today. Our Constitution's revolutionary concepts of sovereignty in the people and significant guarantees of personal rights were, as John A. Howard has written, quote, generated by a people for whom Christianity had been for a century and a half the compelling feature of their lives. It was Jesus who first stated that all men are created equal and that every person is valued and loved by God. End of quote. Professor Denise D'Souza reminds us, quote, The attempt to ground respect for equality on a purely secular basis ignores the vital contribution by Christianity to its spread. It is folly to believe that it could survive without the continuing aid of religious belief. End of quote. Religious values and political realities are so interlinked in the origin and perpetuation of this nation that we cannot lose the influence of Christianity in the public square without seriously jeopardizing our freedoms. I maintain that this is a political fact, well qualified for argument in the public square by religious people whose freedom to believe and act must always be protected by what is properly called our first freedom, the free exercise of religion.